What equipment do I need for portrait photography? You probably haven't even read through the manual completely yet. Now, this also applies to boudoir and high school seniors and engagements and literally anything that isn't event-based, like a wedding. Firstly, do you have gas? That's gear acquisition syndrome. Most photographers get it at some point, usually pretty early on in their career. And it's when we feel that we need to buy the most expensive version of every piece of gear out there before we'll be legit and before anyone would pay us for our photography. And it's just totally not true. It's a fear-based excuse. And I'm gonna go over some different things that you actually do need to be a profitable professional photographer in the portrait space and how to save money getting there. It's showtime. Hey, I'm Mike Lloyd. I run a multi six figure boudoir studio here in California. You're working with a professional here! I've been in business 11 years and I've been teaching photography and business for eight of those. And I'm gonna share some of my biggest tips when it comes to buying new gear, what you actually need and how to pick out the right stuff. So the four things I'm gonna cover when to actually buy something, cameras and lenses, then we'll talk lighting, then we'll get into editing equipment. Not bad, not bad. So let's start with when to actually buy something. Anything that we have is a tool for a job. So if the tools you have can get the job done, you don't need to buy new tools. If I've got a saw and I can already cut through things, I don't need more saws. I can only saw so many things at the same time, one, right? Yes, there's benefits to having multiple camera bodies in case one of them fails. Obviously different lenses do different things, but figuring out what it is you're actually gonna do will tell you what gear you need. So if you're shooting sports, you'll get a set up for sports. If you're shooting portraits like we're talking about today, this is what I'd recommend. And you don't need to buy more stuff until the stuff you have cannot get the job done. So for example, my first pro DSLR was the Canon 5D Mark II. Great camera at the time, it was making me money, but then the Mark III came out and I really wanted to upgrade my camera, but I didn't need to. And I was having a hard time justifying the thousands of dollars on this new camera when the one I had was doing just fine. Then a client called me up, said, hey, I bought a new motorcycle. I want to do photos on this bike. Can you do it? I'm like, I think so. So I went out to a busy intersection and I literally just like, try to photograph cars as they were driving by to see if I could shoot moving objects. And I could not. The camera didn't have as good an autofocus as I needed to track moving subjects. Also, the lens that I had could not rack fast enough to actually continuously focus on the moving vehicles. So I had to get something new. So I basically charged my client the cost of the Mark III and I went and bought a new camera. We did the shoot, it was awesome. Then eventually the Mark IV came out and I wanted it, but I didn't need it. Then a client asked if I could do some video stuff for them. I don't really do video stuff, but the capabilities of the Mark IV made it so much easier to do autofocus during video, to track focus using the touch screen on the back, shot 4K, like a lot of really good things with that camera. So I charged them the cost of the camera, I did the video shoot, and I upgraded my stuff. Then I switched from Canon DSLRs to the Nikon mirrorless, and I got a blog post about that on the boudoirguild.com, so you can go check that out to find out why I made that switch. But the point is, I didn't upgrade my gear until the current gear I had could no longer do the job I needed to do. And then I used my client's money to buy my new stuff instead of going into debt using credit cards and whatnot because that is not a sustainable business practice. So buy the stuff you need to get the job done and you don't need anything more. If you do need something new, like that motorcycle shoot, and in hindsight, I probably would have done this, rent the gear. There's been a handful of shoots I've needed a 70 to 200 for. I almost never use that lens. I've probably used it six times in my career. So I just rent it on days that I need it. it Cost me $30 a day from my local camera shop. Or you can use someone like borrowlenses.com, get the gear for the day or for the weekend, however long you need it, and then send it back. Because it's way easier to spend 30 or $60 on a piece of equipment that you use once a year than spending $2,000, $3,000 on something that you're still only gonna use once a year. Obviously we can buy equipment for tax deduction purposes. That's a different conversation. We're just talking utility here today. All right, let's get down to it. So what camera and lenses do you actually need? I recommend a full frame camera. Now, Nikon, Sony, Canon, Fujifilm, they all make full frame cameras. That is the image sensor size. So it's a full 35 millimeters, 
that's full frame. And they're better in low light performance than some of the beginner or, well, than all the beginner or mid-range stuff that use a crop sensor. So it's a smaller sensor. The other reason I recommend a full frame camera for portraits specifically is because we work in studio spaces that are generally not giant open warehouses. If you have that kind of space, amazing, I'm jealous. But here in Silicon Valley, that would be like 10 grand a month, and that's a lot of money for space that I just don't need. So getting a full frame sensor will keep your lenses their actual focal length. And that means a 50 millimeter lens on a full frame camera is effectively a 50 millimeter lens. Take that same lens, put on a crop sensor, depending on the crop sensor, you're gonna multiply that 50 by 1.4, 1.6, or in the case of the Olympus Micro Four Thirds, you're gonna double that focal length. So that 50 millimeter lens is now a 100 millimeter lens in what you're actually seeing through the camera. And you're like, well, that's cool. I can zoom farther now. You can, but you can't zoom out any farther. So if you want a full body shot of somebody and you're on a crop sensor, you need a wider angle lens and then you get wide angle distortion and you just can't back up far enough in these smaller spaces like most of our photo studios. So if you don't need to zoom in on something really far away, the crop sensor isn't going to help you. It's probably going to hurt you. And a full frame camera won't make you have to step outside and shoot through an open window because your lenses zoom in too far. I love the mirrorless cameras because of their auto face tracking. Again, a lot of benefits to that. Go over to boudoirguild.com, check out my blog post on why I love the Nikon mirrorless system. They're not paying me to do that. I'm just sharing the information with you as to why I switched specifically, the benefits to that system, and why I think it's great for boudoir. And so lens-wise, I use a 35 and a 50 millimeter lens for 99% of my images. Sometimes I'll go super wide angle if I want a really cinematic effect. And like I said, occasionally I'll rent a 70 to 200 if I'm gonna do something outdoors, but 99% of my work is with two prime lenses. And the reason I use these prime lenses, because prime lenses are almost always sharper than zoom lenses. So a prime lens has one focal length, for example, 50 millimeter, and that's it. It's not a zoom that would go, you know, 24 to 70 or 24 to 105. You don't get that range, but you get a sharper picture and a wider aperture, which is the hole inside that opens up to let light in. Prime lenses usually open up wider. They can open to f1.2 or f1.8 or 2.8, whereas zoom lenses, the expensive ones to get to 2.8, but they don't get to the, the ones, you know, the 1.2, the 1.4, the 1.8. So you get more light in, but you also get more dramatic portraits in a shallower depth of field, which is when you focus on the eyes and the background goes blurry, you get a more dramatic effect when the aperture is open wider. So better low light performance, sharper image, more dramatic photos. I think that's a win. They're usually a little bit cheaper than zoom lenses because there are less components inside. Not always. They're going to be lighter weight, which is cool, but... The only downside is that you have to move closer and farther from your subject to change your composition. Call it zoom with your feet. But if I had to take three steps forward and then three steps back to take my next shot. That's so fast, brown boy. Cool, I'm gonna get my cardio in for the day. I kind of think that's a win. I've never felt held back because I don't use zoom lenses. And the times I've used them, I just didn't get the, the same sharpness that I get with the primes. So for me, it's a no brainer. You like it? Let's talk lighting. Lighting serves two purposes. Flatter your subject, separate them from the background. Two lights, plenty for most photographers. Now, obviously, you can get more creative. You can have a rim light. You can have a background light. You can do a hair light. You can throw gels on to change the color of your lights, get all kinds of crazy effects, add a ton of depth in an open room. But generally for portraits and boudoir or seniors, we don't want that busy a scene. For some really creative fine art stuff, totally, but for most of our client work, we're not doing that. We wanna flatter our subject, separate them from the background, so the dark side of our subject doesn't blend into the background, for example. So two lights are gonna be plenty for almost everybody. Now, which lights should you get? I recommend flashes over constant lights because constant light, like what these video lights are, or like Kino flows and stuff, they can be bright, but they're not as bright as a flash would be. And that's good because if you had that amount of light constantly aimed at your client's face, they'd be all squinty and like not even able to look. It, it's like looking at the sun or watching somebody weld. They're just not gonna have a good expression on their face. 
with that intense light directly in their eyeballs. So the flash will allow you to shoot more dramatic scenes and have more control over your light because you don't have to worry about blinding your clients every time you take a photo. Now, some people are like, yeah, but with a constant light, I can see exactly what it, I'm gonna get and then there's no guesswork. Well, you can flick on the modeling lamp, which is a little like permanently running bulb on the front of any flash unit that will preview what you're about to see. Also, once you just start using your flash units, you're gonna know what the light's gonna do. I can set up an entire scene, dial in my settings and be like 95% there before I ever take a photo. So you'll learn your gear and then there's no more guesswork anyway. It's really not that scary. I use the Flashpoint 600s. You could use Godox also. It's the same product, it's just one is sold through Adorama, one is sold through B&H. I like the 600s more than the 200s, which are the smaller like speed light versions, because those just aren't powerful enough for me. I want more versatility, whereas the 600s, you can turn them down enough so that you can just gently light the scene, add fill lights, things like that. But they're also bright enough that we can go outside. I can turn daytime into nighttime and I can shoot some really dramatic stuff because they'll overpower the sun. That's pretty darn cool. They also have high speed sync. They do TTL. Really, really high quality products at a really low price. They're like 500 bucks and you can get them on sale all the time. As far as light modifiers go, that's the thing on the front of your flash that will shape the light, like these Octaboxes here. I use uh, almost entirely three foot by four foot softbox with a grid on it, which just helps to aim my light a little bit better. That's how I get my dark and moody look or using a strip box. I mean, there's a ton of light modifiers. That's a whole other video, so check the channel for that. But you really don't need a ton of stuff. We want flattering light. So a big softbox, like a three foot by four foot is gonna be great or a big umbrella or an Octabox. Like anything big is gonna give you good soft light to flatter your subject. Smaller things will give you harder light, which are good for like a rim light or a background light, little things like that. So that's what I recommend. Get these Flashpoint 600s, a big softbox, maybe something smaller as a background light, like the honeycomb grids, and you're gonna be golden. That is why I won't do two shows a night anymore, babe. I won't. Let's talk editing software. There's really two choices. You have file management systems and you have editing systems. Photoshop is strictly for editing. Lightroom is mostly file management. So that's when you flag things, you give them ratings, you add colored labels, things like that. But it also has Adobe Camera Raw built in, so you can do a ton of editing in there, but it's global stuff, it's not localized like Photoshop would be, which means I can adjust the entire scene's contrast, colorization, shadows, highlights, whereas Photoshop, you have the patch tool and you have clone stamping and more precise. It's like putting on makeup versus doing plastic surgery. An alternative to Lightroom would be Capture One, another phenomenal piece of software but the reason I use Photoshop and Lightroom is because they're both made by Adobe, so I know they're always going to sync together. Whereas if Capture One doesn't update fast enough to work with Adobe's Photoshop, you might have compatibility issues, and I never want to be able to not deliver my client's stuff because of a software malfunction. Whereas I know the Adobe stuff is always gonna work together. Yes, there's glitches every time there's software updates, but literally everything has that. Your best chances are those, and it's like 10 bucks a month. I think it's a no-brainer. little gasoline. Low torch, no problem. So that's how you should pick out your gear. Pick a camera, minimal amount of lenses, minimal amount of lights to get the job done. If you need anything more, you can rent it to test drive it before you buy it, if you even need to buy it. And then editing, keep it simple. Photoshop and Lightroom are the way to go. So to learn more, don't forget to check out the next video.